Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Holston Valley Unitarian Universalist Church. I am the Reverend Tiffany Anderson, the minister of this church, and my pronouns are she and her. I am so glad to be with you today. Thank you so much for joining us. If you are visiting us for the first time, you are especially welcome. Michelle at the visitor's table by the door can help you get oriented if you have any questions. If you have little ones, our greeters can show you the way to our nursery, which is available during the service for children ages six and younger. Please be aware that our services are filmed and on YouTube. There's a chance that you might be seen in our YouTube videos. If you want to make sure that you are absolutely not on camera, you can sit in the perfume free zone over here or in the section closest to this back table by the library. Yesterday was International Day of Peace and this year's theme for the United Nations observance is called cultivating a culture of peace. One of the ways we can cultivate a culture of peace is engaging in the practices of repentance and repair outlined in Rabbi Danya Ruttenberg's book on repentance and repair, making amends in an unapologetic world which was the Unitarian Universalist Association's 2023-2024 Common Read. The journey toward a world community with peace, liberty, and justice for all is a long one. It has taken generations, and we are all part of that journey. Every long journey is taken one step at a time, and it goes easier when we go together. So let's go together by singing our opening hymn, One More Step, and take one more step forward today. This is hymn number 168 in the thicker gray hymnal. Please rise with us in body or spirit for hymn 168, One More Step. sit with us in stillness, lifting our intentions for peace in our hearts, minds, and spirits. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Alesha. My pronouns are she and they, and I'm your service leader today. Uh, I do a lot of organizing the music around this church, but I'm also your local rebel with a cause. <laughs> I'm trying to do everything I can to advocate for justice and peace and alleviation of suffering by deliberate intention around the world. The work of peace and repairing our relationships is a big part of sharing love and pursuing justice. We do this in our individual relationships, in our communities and institutions, and we call upon the nations that we are connected to to do this work as well. And sharing love and pursuing justice is a large part of our vision for building this beloved community. 
Today we will invite to come help us with our chalice lighting. We work together as a church to transform ourselves, our community, and our world by sharing love, pursuing justice, and seeking wonder. Our time for all ages today is two videos. Uh, so we're asking the young and the young at heart, you may stay in your seats this week. Uh, we have a very special video message for you. Around the world, millions of children are growing up in conflict. Caught in the crossfires of war, these children are uniquely vulnerable. UNICEF created Poems for Peace to give children a platform to explain in their own words the impact of war on their lives and their hopes and dreams for the future. Today we're going to hear two of those poems. First, a poem from Fedir in Ukraine, spoken in his native language, and then a poem from Aisha in Nigeria, which will be in English. We invite you to not just hear their words, but to see how they dress and where they live and where they go to school and to share their intentions for a peaceful life for themselves and children just like them all over the world. Всі кажуть, школа це цікаво, самостійні перші кроки. Я вже забув, війна все вкрала, не відбулись мої уроки. І тільки десь там у куточку той спогад вогником вже вліє. Мій перший клас – письмаря дочки, і перша вчителька, як мрія. Тепер у школу йдемо на тиждень раз. І в укритті ми сидимо, як у відпіллі. А так хотілося б увірватися у клас і з друзями пограти на лозвіллі. Я вірю, день настане, скінчиться війна, і не виття з сирен, а шкільні дзвоники усюди. І дітлихи до школи йдуть, приша пора. Чекай, гімназія. Цей Федір, скоро буду. The Rocky Mountains and the fantastic views have all dimmed because of the dark fog. All the chase and the memories we saw have worn out like a piece of luck. In this world filled with chaos and strife, let's come together and change our lives with love and kindness as our guide. Peace will bloom and hearts will collide. Let's embrace diversity. Let differences unite. For in unity, we find strength and light. Together, we can build a world so grand, where peace and harmony forever stand. Spread compassion, let empathy flow, and watch as peace begins to grow. In every action, big or small, let peace be our guiding call. May peace prevail in every land. Hand in hand, let's make a stand. With hope in our hearts, we will find a way to create a peaceful world starting today. Today, on this day, after the day after International Day of Peace, we pray for over 110 armed conflicts scattered throughout our world. Some of these conflicts make the headlines, others do not. Some of them started recently, while others have lasted for more than 50 years. Some are officially declared wars, and some are forms of violence harder to name. And we pray for all of them, all the people affected by violence. We pray for peace in the Americas, especially for the people of Mexico, Colombia, Venezuela, Ecuador, Honduras, Nicaragua, El Salvador, Argentina, Chile, Brazil, and Haiti. We pray for peace in Europe, especially for the people of Ukraine, Crimea, Transdenistria, Moldova, South Ossetia, Abkhazia, Georgia, Nagura, Krabach, Azerbaijan, Armenia, and Russia. We pay, we pray for peace in Asia, especially for the people of Afghanistan, China, India, Myanmar, Pakistan, and the Philippines. We pray for peace in Africa, 
especially the people of Burkina Faso, Cameroon, the Central African Republic, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Ethiopia, Mali, Mozambique, Nigeria, Senegal, Somalia, South Sudan, and Sudan. We pray for peace in the Middle East and North Africa, especially for the people of Cyprus, Egypt, Gaza, Iraq, Israel, Libya, Morocco, Palestine, Syria, Turkey, Yemen, and the Western Sahara. And we pray for peace for all who struggle in conflicts, both armed and unarmed. We pray that politics be oriented toward the common good. We pray that families be oriented toward acceptance and growth. We pray that religious communities be oriented toward understanding one another. We pray that those with power lift up and listen to those who have less power. We pray that those who profit from the suffering of others repent of their harmful ways and begin the work of repair. We pray that a healing balm be poured over all who are suffering. We pray that the spark of peace finds a place to settle in each of our hearts, that our love grows, that we find our way to peace together. We pray that greed give way to generosity, that fear give way to safety, and hate give way to love. Creator of peace, create peace within us. Creator of peace, create peace within us. Creator of peace, create peace within each of us. Om Shanti, Shalom, Salam, blessed be, and amen.
Today we pray for peace together with all of our other joys and sorrows knit together on this table of light. If you want to shine a light on your journey, you can share a joy or a sorrow in person by using these candle cards that are located on that back table. Or if you'd like to share a joy or a sorrow from a distance, you can email me at minister at hvuuc.org. We got a lot of them today, and that's a good thing. That shows that we are a community that's really supporting each other. Um, uh, Alesha, Noel, do you mind coming up and lighting a candle each time I say a thing? A candle of joy and support for a friend of the church, Phoenix Bell Shelton, who has co-led services here with me before. They say to us, I would love it if you would let those in worship know that I will be seeing the Ministerial Fellowshipping Committee on Friday, as you all have made part of their journey possible by giving them a place to live for the summer while they did clinical pastoral education training at the hospital. All prayers and positive energies are welcome for Phoenix in this journey. A candle for our veterans and active duty military. On this day of peace, I am mindful of the unique suffering that they have encountered and want to hold them in our hearts. A candle for Gary. I had my gallbladder removed this past Monday and I am healing well. A candle of joy from Bradley who gets a prize for the wildest candle card I have ever read. <laughs> Four years ago, my dad bought a small black pot-bellied pig for his farm. It escaped in a week and was never found. Last week, dad saw on his hunting camera a black pot-bellied pig. <laughs> he is much fatter now but still alive and living his best life in the woods. A much, much better life for him than if he was still on my father's farm. So a candle of liberation and joy. <laughs> in the complexity of our community together, uh, the next two candles are, are much more serious. Uh, a sorrow for friend of the church, Dallas, who passed away this week from a brain tumor. Her friends here want you all to know that she was supported and she was honored in her passing and that her spirit was felt by one of our own at Bridget's Well in Kildare, Ireland, less than 24 hours before her passing. Her friends take comfort knowing that she is in the arms of the goddess and that the love that is bigger than any of us is holding all of us. And a sorrow for our very own much beloved Wayne Johnson. His struggle with dementia and ALS came to an end this week when he passed away. I want you all to know that in addition to being a lover of the wide outdoors and of hunting and fishing, if he wasn't outside, this place right here was Wayne's favorite place to be in the whole world. And that you all made that so with your love, patience, and compassion. I am so grateful that Wayne isn't suffering anymore and I miss him. So let's be extra gentle and supportive of each other this week and hold Anne with love and support. If you wish to light your own candle, please approach the side of the table that is closest to you and the closest candle keeper will assist you. Please light the candles at the back of the table first so that no one has to reach over an open flame. And if you wish for us to light a candle for you, please raise your hand until I acknowledge you and I will come light a candle for you. 
Our community is so much bigger than just those of us who are in the building this morning, and so we light a candle to hold space for those who are not physically present with us, but are ever in our hearts. unspoken in our hearts and minds. today is an excerpt from Rabbi Donya Ruttenberg's book on repentance and repair. People hurt one another. Sometimes the harm is unintentional and even born of goodwill and the desire to help. Sometimes it's a result of ignorance or lack of information. Sometimes it happens because of cowardice. Sometimes it reflects a self-protective impulse, a desire to protect one's own self-image or concern about organizational public relations. Sometimes a long process of dehumanization makes atrocities possible. But whatever the cause, people manage to inflict damage in a myriad of ways, from hurt feelings to lost livelihood, the infliction of trauma, the perpetration of hate, against a vulnerable demographic, or even the loss of life. Sometimes harm can be repaired, and sometimes it can't. 
Regardless, in a moral universe, there is work to be done whenever harm is inflicted. When I breathe in, I breathe in peace. Will you breathe with me? Let's give ourselves permission to just set everything else aside, even the topic for the day, for 60 seconds, and just be in this present moment together. The tick of the clock, the moment of this one breath, and then another. The softness of the chair you sit on, the floor under your feet, the hum of the HVAC unit, and gentle rustling of others sitting with you. Your body in this space, the air around you, the promise, the covenant that you are with people that know your inherent dignity and will care for you and breathe in peace. And breathe in peace. And breathe in peace. This is a practice of peace. And this world needs peace and practices of peace. Because when we witness the violence and strife, the injustices and pain that have a foothold, both in distant nation states and right here in our backyard, we know we need peace. We know there is work to be done anytime, anywhere that harm is inflicted. Many religious, spiritual, and ethical paths have within them practices of peace, and in our collective pluralism here, we get to embrace many of them. And Rabbi Danya Ruttenberg, in her book on repentance and repair, making amends in an unapologetic world, she introduces us to a fairly challenging but deeply effective practice of peace. She has dedicated a large portion of her life to studying the ancient Jewish scholar Maimonides, who has pulled this practice of peace from the Talmud, a collection of ancient Jewish texts that comes from the fifth century CE and earlier. The practice of repentance and repair is a practice of peace that leans into the idea that peace must be more than the absence of conflict, but the presence of justice, that true peace takes intentional work. Rabbi Danya Ruttenberg shows us how rushing toward peace without doing the work of repentance and repair fails to build a true and lasting peace. She gives us several examples, but as a white Southerner, the example she gave that impacted me the most was how we as a nation behaved right after the Civil War. She outlines an abundance of examples of how shortly after the conflict ended, northern white clergy began preaching forgiveness, reconciliation, and unity with white southerners at the expense of the justice and even the safety of black Americans, whether newly emancipated or already free. The need for repentance and repair was buried under premature calls for forgiveness and unity, which meant that harm just continued in new forms. People were simply transferred from slaves to exploited tenant farmers under a sharecropping system that they could not escape. Economic slavery. Additional generations of oppression continued with lynchings and Jim Crow laws. 
Unity and forgiveness between white northerners and white southerners was ultimately deemed more important than actually ending the harm done to black Americans. Without repentance and repair, the cycle of harm continues. Repentance and repair is work, but from that labor can grow a harvest that benefits us all, real peace that comes from real change. Instead of a cheap grace sort of peace that leaves so many unpeaceful bubbling right under the surface, Rabbi Ruttenberg calls for the patient and intentional work of reconciliation. You're going to hear the word work so many times, y'all. It's work. This practice can create an authentic and lasting peace within us, though, worth the work, peace within us, between us, and that can even apply to entire families, communities, institutions, and even nations. It's real work, though. It can feel slow. It can feel daunting. It can make us wonder where to begin. Thankfully, though, our rabbi brings with her more than just the challenge. She brings to us an intentional process laid out by her studies. The process is about each of us doing our own work. So as we go through the steps of this process, I'm going to invite myself and each of us to not project this process outward onto others, but to instead consider how each of us have repentance and repair work to do. And to think about how each of us, you and I, can practice these steps in our own lives. None of it's easy. It is worth the effort involved. These are the keys to bringing true peace into our relationships. Like our congregational covenant says, to use conflict as an opportunity for transformation. Step one then is naming and owning the harm. Did I say this wasn't gonna be easy? It is gonna be worth it. Let's make that the mantra today. Not easy, but worth it. Rutenberg says, starting the process with a confession of harm goes against many of our cultural and often our individual instincts to shift blame, to minimize the problem, to focus on our excellent and pure intentions. I know that's what I do to put off that uncomfortable conversation for another day. Oh, no, I've never done that which means that the process starts with courage to really understand that we've done harm, to not deflect or escape, but really say, I made a mistake. Part of why I am holding this practice together with the meditative practice of breathing in peace is that just this one act is going to trigger defensiveness, the desire to fight or flight. Or maybe that's just me, but I think it's more than me. But we can do hard things. Each one of us is capable of breathing in peace, understanding when we've done harm, and saying, I made a mistake. And this is only the beginning of the process. Step two is starting to change. We've all heard the aphorism, the best apology is changed behavior. Well, our ancient Jewish sources agree. Our rabbi translates it by saying, truly being ready to change, to be different and make different choices is a critical, non-negotiable part of the process. It may be easier to point to examples where this has not happened than where it has. Rabbi Ruttenberg points out that in the early 2010s, Canada was apologizing for the deadly residential school program that stole indigenous children from their homes and sometimes buried them in unmarked graves to cover up abuses. But at the same time, that they were issuing those apologies. They were developing oil and gas pipelines on indigenous treaty land without permission, claiming that their energy interests, and I quote, can no longer afford the investment uncertainty created by issues around Aboriginal participation. Basically, we can't risk them saying no, 
so we're just not going to ask. Ruttenberg says, the work to become different didn't happen, so the government in the end did not make different choices. Without transformation, there's no repentance. There's only the same harm, again and again, perpetrated in different ways. When I breathe in, I breathe in peace. We know that changed behavior says what words cannot, and that behavior changes when we engage in transformational repentance. This third step, then, is restitution and accepting consequences. While the second, when the second step has been engaged in authentically, then accepting consequences for our actions and being willing to make things right will come naturally, even if it, too, is work because the pain of not making things right will be way more uncomfortable than the pain of doing the work. This is ancient Jewish wisdom, but it's also the wisdom of the 12-step program, steps eight and nine. Make a list of all the persons we have harmed and become willing to make amends to them all and step nine, to make direct amends to such people whenever possible, especially uh, when to do so uh, would not injure them or others. This work to make it right is more than checking off a list or going through motions, but is centered on those who we have harmed and truly discovering what they need, and then giving them what they need to make it right, even if it's an ended relationship because we're centering the person we've harmed, not our own agenda, as much as that hurts. Rabbi Ruttenberg points out that the second step of changed behavior and the third step of making it right and the fourth step that we haven't really gotten to yet are really not linear. These are things that are often done together and maybe shuffled up. It's a process, it's work. The fourth step then is apology. This step confused me the first time I read through Rabbi Ruttenberg's book. To be honest, if I've named the harm, stated the ch started to change myself to the point where it won't happen again, and done the real work of making it right, rather that be accepting consequences of my actions or paying restitution, then how does saying I'm sorry to the person I've harmed really hold up? against these other challenging transformative practices. Here's how Rabbi Ruttenberg clarifies it. A real apology is not aimed at the person, not aimed at the person who has been hurt, but rather is given in relationship with them. It requires vulnerability and empathetic listening. It demands a sincere offering of regret and sorrow for one's own actions. It requires understanding when approaching a victim might harm them further and navigating that with sensitivity. The goal is not to do more harm, but to do the work that is healing, repairing. This means that the victim's needs must be centered in the process, always. This is why apology is all the way down the list in step four. A proper apology geared toward actually healing the relationship centered on the needs of the person or people who were harmed can only happen authentically when we've acknowledged our wrong, started to change, and made substantial efforts to make it right. Only then is there hope of repairing a broken relationship. And even then, Offering forgiveness is not required of the one who was harmed. Rabbi Ruttenberg makes that very clear that that's an essential part of the Jewish tradition. The final step then is making different choices. Are you seeing how this is a practice of peace? Are you seeing how if the entire world engaged in these practices, there wouldn't be any more room for violence or war or perpetual harm of any sort? If we actively learned from our mistakes as individuals, institutions, and nations that there really wouldn't be any more room for war? 
Rabbi Ruttenberg says that making a better choice will happen naturally because the person is a changed person in the ways that matter. Breathe in peace and breathe out love. This is a practice of peace and love. It is inspiring and it is intimidating. It makes me wonder how my life and our world would be transformed if we courageously and sincerely engaged in repentance and repair. Repentance, learning from our mistakes to the point where we change. Repair, making it right with the ones that we have harmed. Peace, a presence of justice and healing in our lives. What would my parenting of a small child have looked like if I had been willing to engage in this process rather than take refuge in the fact that I had all the power in the relationship and could essentially be a jerk or unfair when I was tired or grumpy or stressed out? What would it look like to engage in these practices of repentance and repair nationally in our relating to Native American peoples? What would it look like in East Tennessee's relationship to the Cherokee people right over the mountains if we had the will to go further in the process than just acknowledge that we are standing on stolen land? What would it look like for the innocent people trapped in the 110 plus armed conflicts that are existing throughout the world if factions were willing to engage in this process of transformation that would result in both individuals and nations committing to actually stopping their harmful behavior? And what would it look like if each of us here committed to engaging in these processes of peace, repentance, and repair? And if we really understood and committed to engaging in these practices together as a community, it might just look like a seed, a seed of world community of peace, justice, and liberty for all planted here today. Let there be peace on earth and let it begin with us. So be it. See to it. We come from many places along different paths bringing different truths. We come with different histories and different realities. And yet we come together as one people with faith that we can use our differences to heal ourselves and each other, to bring wholeness to a fractured world. We come seeking to find community, to find acceptance of who we are. In this place, we may find others who are much like us and others who are much different. We extinguish our chalice, but we carry its light in our hearts May that flame remind us that we are a people taught by different stories, with many voices, but always one people, working for a world where love creates justice and justice gives birth to peace. Thank you for being with us. We would love it if you could stay for coffee hour. We have a bunch of announcements today. Tri Pride is coming up and we are going to do another community art project at the HVUUC Tri Pride booth. Tristan is currently collecting art supplies for the collage and volunteers for the Tri Pride booth. There's Tristan. Please see him after the service to sign up or to get more details on what supplies might be needed. I want to remind you all that there is an incredible astronomy and geology learning opportunity on Saturday, October 5th at 2 p.m. It makes every little cell of my nerd brain happy that this is happening. And so I hope you will go to the events page on our website to get more information about that. 
I know I'm not normally the one to do announcements, um, but today I really had two things that I really wanted to talk to you guys about. The first is vital for the life of this church, and the second is vital for the life of the world. So first, the church will start smaller. Our biggest fundraiser every year is the annual service auction, and it begins with each of us considering what we might be willing and able to donate to the auction's efforts. We try to stay away from garage sale type items, instead focusing on events and services. Child care and handy person work are favorite services, and events range from specialty meals for a set number of people, game nights, hikes, pool parties, and movie nights. These sorts of events benefit our communities in two ways. Uh, first, we get a chance to know someone with shared interest in the congregation. You're gonna end up doing an activity with people you've maybe not met before, and that can be really cool to get to know them. And second, uh, we get a chance to financially support the ministries of the church. This year, when I've not been here doing my work with you all, I've been spending a lot of time at the roller skating rink with my son, and I've spent a lot of time playing tabletop role-playing games with my friends. To the point that one day when I was skating around the skating rink, I uh, was inspired to write my own tabletop one-shot titled Drama at the Skate Rink. <laughs> You get to pretend to be dramatic middle schoolers. It's very cathartic. So today, I'm going to go home and I'm gonna look at my calendar and I'm gonna figure out what day in the calendar year I want to host my game as a church auction event. And then I'm going to go to the church's website in the news section and find the link to the auction website so that I can submit this event to the auction. It is that simple. I hope you all will think of what sort of fun things you want to offer. You don't have to make up your own game to do it. Although I think Gerald is probably somewhere being really pleased that I did this. Maybe he was involved, I'm not sure. So, um, so then in November, I'll show up with my calendar ready to bid on all sorts of fun and delicious events. So I hope you guys will join me in making the auction a great success this year by donating events and services and then showing up on November 16th to bid. And if money's tight, we even have what we call auction equity funds so that nobody is left out of the fun. And you can reach out to me or Greg Kramer for more information about the auction equity funds and for more information about the auction in general. So that one's the announcement for the church. Here's the announcement for the world. Next Saturday is the climate justice revival. And y'all, I want you to know that this isn't about a narrow focus on climate change. This is about a wide interconnected web of environmental and social justice issues that we face locally as a community in 2024 and figuring out how we can make a difference in our local environment. During this climate justice gathering, we will be working together to explore where the world's needs and our own personal power to make a change intersect, and then we're gonna chart a course to make meaningful action about it. Teacher and reporter Ursula Wolf Rocca puts it this way, it can be overwhelming to witness, experience, take in all of the injustices of the moment, but the good news is that they're all connected. So if your little corner of work involves pulling at one of the threads, you are helping unravel the whole cloth. So this is my invitation for you to come join me and Dana Enzor and the Social Justice Committee in pulling at the threads that we have access to. We will meet here at 10 a.m., have a vegetarian and omnivore-friendly baked potato bar lunch provided by the best chef in the church for the low price of $8 a person, and will be done no later than 3 p.m., but I think I might be able to get you out a little early. That's this Saturday. There's a QR code on the back of the bulletin, and we need to know if you're coming as soon as possible. The info on the bulletin says that we need your registration by Wednesday, but really, if you can register by today, that would really help us in our planning. So 
I'm grateful that we're taking meaningful steps together for community, for peace, and for this planet, the Earth, the only home that we've got. And let's celebrate that planet with our closing hymn, which is in the Thinner Tail Hymnal number 1064. This is also when we collect the offering. Pledges and plate donations support us in doing the work that we are called to, sharing love, pursuing justice, and seeking wonder, building this community where we are all trying to be the best humans we can be. Please rise with us and body our spirit for our closing hymn number 1064. Blue Boat Home. this week and every week. May justice lead us to the calling of this moment. May wonder meet us right where we're at. May we discover our collaborators and our companions, and may love guide us on our journey of transformation. Blessed be, amen, and go in peace. Yay, church.